that is, you know, put forward in, in the direct in the Declaration of Independence. That, that is, even despite, you know, being enslaved. That is, despite being slaughtered. That is, despite being oppressed. How does, how was that able to galvanize so many folks, even, you know, folks who, again, had no reason really to believe in this country? Well, they might not have believed in this country, and I might be reading this into people, but my big thing is I believe that human beings, as part of the human project, not necessarily the American project, believe in human self-determination. They want to have control over their lives, even when they live in situations in which they don't have control of their lives for whatever reason, whether it's a systemic reason, whether it's a governmental reason, whether it's because you have you know, seven little kids clinging to your legs, whether you have to work for whatever. I mean, this idea that everybody is free is always limited except for a very small number of people. But I think that people want to have human self-determination. So from the very beginning, when the, the founders wrote those words in the Declaration of Independence, which we know they only meant, meant them, right? <laughs> the, the, one of the early writers, one of our first poets, Phyllis Wheatley, writes a letter to an indigenous minister and is like, well, that sounds really good. But why aren't we in that? And and I think those, having those words articulated made it easier for people to say, I have the right to this. And we actually, it, it's actually sort of interesting and we can sort of walk this through in our history, but one of the truisms in American history is that if you have rights, you rest on the Constitution. And if you don't have rights, you rest on the Declaration of Independence. And that Declaration of Independence has been there for, you know, we always point to Central Falls and to some of the other declarations, but there are actually hundreds of declarations based on the Declaration of Independence in which people are saying, hey, what about me too? And I think that having those words written down and combining with people's desire to have determination over their lives has been an extraordinarily potent force. What you also we showcase in this book so well is the fact that there's been this clash of narratives in, in our country, almost from the uh, outset, where you have folks who believe in this sort of traditionalist, hierarchical uh, mindset of, you know, white, straight, cisgender man at the top, and everybody else at the bottom, whereas you have people, as you just mentioned, folks who are constantly trying to expand our democracy. And so I want to ask you, is are we destined to continue to always have this battle, or is there you know, going to be a winner at some point? And what does that look like? That's a really good question. So you're putting it much more articulately than I would, because I think for me, what the world comes down to, at least now, is the way I think about it, is some people in the world believe that we are all equal and have a right to be treated equally before the law and have a right to have a say in our government. And of course, that's what's articulated in the Declaration of Independence. But then there are other people who think that the world is organized in such a way that some people are better than others, whether because of the, the money that they have, or their religion, or the color of their skin, or their education, or where they're from, or any of those things. And they think that they're better than other people and have a right, and maybe even a duty, to rule everybody else. And those two strands, I think, follow and contest throughout American history, and perhaps through world history. I only do America. But the, the, the question is whether we will always have that contention. And you know, humans got a human. So I would say we will always have that contention. But our, our hope, my hope, is that we will figure out how to create guardrails so that those people who are questing for power and money and control over the rest of us are not able to do that. Certainly, that's hope. Um, you talk about early on in the book that democracies actually die more often at the ballot box than they do at gunpoint. Now, while that's extremely disconcerting, um, I want to ask you, what is the mechanism in place in, in open societies that allows that to, to be the case? The, so, so why societies, the, the, okay, so let me back up for a second. So the story that emerged 
when I looked at that manuscript the second time was the story of how democracies, how people give up a democracy. Because it's weird, right? If you have all these rights, why would you say, oh no, never mind, I want to give them all away to some, some guy who's going to you know, send my kids off to a war I don't like or take over my, um, my factory or you know, give everything to his cronies and, and end up me having no health care and having no economic rights and, you know, possibly being killed for not being part of the inner circle. And if you think that I was just describing Russia in this moment, I was very deliberately doing that. Um, because one of the things that, you know, more and more you're seeing that happen um, in a number of countries around the world. So the question is, why would somebody choose that? And the, the answer to that, I, I have come to believe, is the, the manipulation of language and the ma manipulation of history. So if you use language in such a way that you destabilize the fact that most people, and again, I'm only gonna talk about America here, except for the places where I could go elsewhere, where you know, most of us agree on most things, we really do. And every poll will tell you that. Most of us want basic gun safety legislation. We want reproductive health care. We want there to be regulations on business. We want fair taxes. And when I say we like these things, I don't mean like by 50.1%. I mean like we're in the 70s and 80s. So how do you divide people along those lines? Well, you, you do a number of things, but one of the ways that has been extraordinarily potent in the United States, of course, has been the issue of race, and we can walk through that, but the larger picture is to try and create an enemy, to create somebody that is responsible for the fact that a certain population that you're trying to bring behind yourself as voters can blame for the fact that they are mad about whatever they're mad about. And if you, if you can divide the population so that it begins to support you, enough that you then are able to control what I call the nodes of the mechanics of democracy, so that you start to make sure certain people can't vote, and then you start to make sure that, that you can pick your voters so that you can stay in power, and then maybe you go ahead and make sure that you can gerrymander districts, and then maybe you can take over the Supreme Court. You do those things, you are able to, to get a population behind you that gives you power. But crucial to that is the creation of a false reality for those people, because you have to make them believe something that's not true. And the whole, uh, the whole Republican project, uh, the modern day Republican project, by the way, it's not traditional Republicanism, was the attempt to create a false reality that people would get behind in order to vote away their democracy. So, um, so we can also talk about how that became a political theory that was really articulated by Russian political thinkers fairly recently, how you create that false reality. But that idea of splitting a democracy by creating a false reality and creating an enemy so that you can get enough people on your side to manipulate the system is what we have seen, but it's also, I think, almost cartoonish in the simplicity of it. How does that, that sort of the, that those myths, how do they also attack not just democracy, but the solidarity? I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, you quote Bill Moyers, the famed journalist in the book, um, and he says, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, you know, if you can get the, the lowliest white man to believe that, you know, he's better, you know, than the highest black man, then you can also, you know, get around to, to fleecing him and picking his pocket. And so I'm wondering, how do we, how do we, how are we able to sort of combat this so that we, you know, can maintain and build our, our coalitions, right? Like I, I talk to my editor at the Seattle Times all the time, Michelle Mazzasa Flores, uh, about how, like, if you look at the 13th and 14th Amendment, they, they passed without one black vote, right? If you look at uh, the 19th Amendment, they passed without one, you know, woman, you know, vote, voting for it, and yet at all these times, the dominant class had to. You know, extend power to other people. So if that is also part of our history as well. This is more sort of a benign you know, history that we have. How do we how do we work towards that? How do we make sure these sort of you know, myths don't hurt you know our solidarity vote? So so I would actually like to pick up how we got these myths first of all, but let me answer what you just said, and that is how do we return to these to a world in which we are 
it's more than just benign, I would call progressive, and it has always been, and not, not even necessarily in a modern day progressive sense, but the idea that you are progressing toward a more just and equal democracy, liberal democracy. Um, so, I, let me start by saying, I think one of the ways you do that is by making sure we're all operating in a reality-based community. <laughs> and that's, and that's, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not actually being flippant about that, but you know, that's a direct quote from the George W. Bush administration to Russ, Ron Susskind when he was trying to nail somebody down on, on a fact, and the person said, you don't understand, you know, you people like you, and he meant on, um, live in a reality-based community. But we're an empire now, we don't have to do that anymore. We make our own reality, and people like you are gonna have to study it, and you'll do a very good job. I just love that part of the book. You guys will do a really good job at it. But, but we're just gonna change reality, and you're always gonna be running behind us. And one of the, the roles, I think, of people like, uh, like the two of us right now is to emphasize reality rather than whatever spin we are getting. And it's not even spin, everybody spins in politics, that's just what you do. But there are a number of politicians out there right now that are lying. I mean, it makes me crazy to read. I'm so sorry, I try not to do this to actual individuals, but I have no respect any longer at all for Marsha Blackburn. I'm sorry, I just don't. <laughs> trying to be nice, but I lose it on her. It just lose it on her. Because it just lies. So I think by returning to a reality-based community, we have the ability to say, no, that's not true. That's not what happened. This is what is happening. And one of the things that has been such a potent force in dividing America is a conjunction of race and class. So if you think about um, the, the, the divisions that started in the United States in the middle of that period we're talking about where people did come together and did, in fact, back um, the, the Civil Rights Act of 57, 1957, uh, Brown versus Board of Education 1954, Civil Rights Act 1957, uh, the, the uh, Civil uh, Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, bipartisan all. Um, the, the people who were against the idea of that liberal coalition that regulated business and provided the basic social safety net and promoted infrastructure and protected civil rights began to say after Brown versus Board of Education, well, hey, wait, 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 you think this government is helping everybody, but what it's really doing is it's redistributing white tax dollars to government programs that help black people and soon brown people and a little bit later women. And therefore, it is a form of socialism. And this whole argument that we have about, you know, is it, is it race or is it class? You know, is, it, is it taxes? Is it race or is it taxes? It's both, because they've very potently been able to say, oh no, I have nothing against my black neighbors, but boy, I don't have taxes. And that reality, the recognition that those two things have been artificially put together, based in our history, it actually comes out of Reconstruction, Calling that sort of stuff out, I think, would really help us get to the point where we were back in a reality-based discourse that offered room to uh, to come together across a lot of different ways. So I have to ask you, what is the role of media in that? And, and knowing that you know media is, is the broad brush, you there are some institutions that are a little bit more reputable than others. Obviously, there's. He's so nice. <laughs> My boss from the Seattle Times is here, so I gotta be my best friend. <laughs> the role of media. So, I think that's a twofold issue in media, threefold. The first piece of the, the what I always want to say about media it is a freaking hard job, and it is a dangerous job. And, you know, when everybody likes to beat up on the media, I'm always like, you know, it's a hard job to do. But if you think about the longer stretch of where we are right now, one of the early pieces of the, the project of the movement conservatives who came to take over the Republican Party, that's what we're dealing with right now, was the, the fact they had a real problem because they hated that New Deal coalition. They hated the idea that the government, actually it's regulating business they were most unhappy about. 
They hated the idea that they were regular prisons. They hated the idea that government would provide a basic social safety net. They didn't like the idea of public investment in infrastructure, and they sure didn't like the idea that the government was going to protect civil rights. But they had a real problem because people liked that stuff. And so in 1951, William F. Buckley Jr. writes a book called God, Man, and Gale, The Superstition of Academic Freedom. That's the subtitle of it. And in it he says, you know, we got a problem because the, every time we try and, and convince people to throw out this government and go back to the 1920s, they don't vote for us. So, so instead of actually telling them that we're going to get rid of that and it's going to be good for them, we just got to got to say we're not going to talk about the the realities of how it's going to play out on the ground. We're going to re, we're going to reinforce Christianity and free market individualism. He calls it, and we're going to start from that place. And we're not those are not negotiable. We're, that's where we're going to start. We're not going to accept any of the stuff that the, liberal, the people backing liberal democracy are. And by 1954, he and his brother-in-law, Albrecht Bazell, had written a book called McCarthy and His Enemies, in which they actually say that anybody who believes in that liberal consensus, and that's virtually everybody in America, Democrats and Republicans both, is a capital L liberal to make them look as if they are uh, organized like the Communist Party, like they're taking over society as a form of socialism. And increasingly, they push the idea that their ideology needs to be represented in the same way that that liberal ideology, which is not a partisan one, it's this idea that the government should behave in this way, or the news would not be fair and balanced. So, I'm not done yet. So, in, 19, in 1971, of course, we get the Powell Memo. And it's really interesting because Lewis Powell writes this memo when he is a lawyer for the Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He then gets on to the Supreme Court. Richard Nixon puts him on the court, and he actually is much mellower on the court than he is with the Powell Memo. But in the Powell Memo, which is online, you can read it, he, um, he says, listen, we've got a real problem. Because the, the liberals have taken over the universities, they've taken over um, the, the publishing industry, they've taken over the law, and they've taken over the newspapers. And we need to push our ideology, this idea that government regulation is bad, the idea that we don't want government to be involved in social welfare. We need to push that ideology in all of these fields. So this is where we get think tanks, for example. They're going to come out of this moment. This is where we're going to get the push for the Federalist Society in the 1980s. Oh, you know, these different ways of trying to push back against what they consider the bad, the bad ideas of liberalism. So by the time you get Reagan in office, this is when we're going to see the real attempt to create this idea that there's room for this other ideology. Not a fact-based reality, but this ideology, and we lose the fairness doctrine which has been part of the American media system since the early 20th century began with radio. Uh, we would have lost it soon after that anyway, because by the 1990s, you've got the rise of talk radio. And talk radio comes out of the fact that AM radio is losing a lot of listeners because FM is so much better uh, acoustically. And they start to look for something to, to talk about that's going to get a lot of ears. And they don't start with politics, by the way. Rush Limbaugh does not start with politics. But he recognizes when he turns to becoming a political shock jock, that's when he gets all the ears. And of course, there's no, uh, there's no longer any attempt to, uh, to regulate what anybody is saying. The idea that you have to actually, you know, be honest and, and, and entertain the other side. So increasingly, then, of course, by 1996, we have the Fox News Channel, which is fair and balanced. And by fair and balanced, <laughs> but by fair and balanced, they had an ideological meaning. And that listen, you can listen to all those other channels and hear that liberal crap about this government, but we're going to give you the ideological version that will balance that out. I mean, there was an ideological principle behind that. So now I think you're seeing the, the constant pressure that that took, kept on mainstream media channels to say, you've got to tell our side. You've got to tell our side it's not going to be fair and balanced. So increasingly now you see a situation where the one that got me the other day was Congress is in crisis. And I'm like, the Democrats are more organized than I've seen in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're doing everything right. Republicans <laughs> and, and, and like, can't even agree to eat lunch together. <laughs> so, so, but you can see this happening there. So, then there's, so that's the long thing. And then the short term, I think it's with the cuts in, in newsrooms. 
I think it's much harder for the young people who don't have years and years and years of experience to be able to say, I'm that's good. You know, you keep that, so that's great. And they report a lot of stuff that is simply a scoop instead of being able to analyze it and saying, no, 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 this is somebody pulling this. And, and so I think there's less depth than there was when there was more money in the news industry. Aren't you sorry you asked? <laughs> Very thorough answer. So I do want to go back just real quickly on why why is this you know, continued sort of divisive myth? But why is it why does it continue to have currency in, in the sense that whether it's the nineteen sixties and Nixon and the Southern strategy, or it's the Reagan and the Reagan Revolution, or it's you know, Trump, you know, forty five, some folks refer to them. Why in the world like we are able to see constantly that you know this playbook at work and we're able to identify this playbook, but why does it continue to have you know, so much currency. There's like no law of diminishing returns with fascism or something. Like this. <laughs> well, first of all, can we identify it? I mean, I think so. So, what I would say is that the historical answer to that, I think, is that because the belief in the liberal consensus after World War II was so incredibly widely shared, that people stopped thinking it was important to talk about democracy. And you see this in 1960, there is a famous, for political scientists anyway, article written in which uh, a great political scientist says, listen, stop talking about democracy, and stop talking about all the stuff that FDR talked about, and, and that Truman talked about, and that Eisenhower talked about, because we all agree. The way to build coalitions now is to work within that framework of the liberal consensus and, and create coalitions where people say, yeah, I'll back you because you're going to give me the pieces of that, of that system that I want. You're going to give me the business regulation I want or the social safety net I want. And you can nail together coalitions that way. And both parties did that. And what they did was they stopped talking about the principles that make people feel like their vote mattered. And what that did is it opened the door for those movement conservatives to tell a great story. And their story was great. It was a mythical story. The idea of the individual against the, the, the giant empire. You know, the idea that you could create your own future, just the government would get out of the way. You know, and, and think about that. We've all, we all heard that, right? And the image of the cowboy comes back, the idea you're going to do it on your own. And, and that myth, which is deeply entwined, I think, both in human literature, but also in the United States, was really attractive. And it was reinforced as well by political, I mean, by popular culture. So think about you, the fact you've got the, the cowboy TV shows in the 1950s after Brown versus Board of Education, in which the Board of Education uh, decision made it seem as if the federal government was catering to that black community in a socialist kind of way. You get the cowboy standing against that. There was a nine cowboy TV shows on the on TV in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And then of course by, you know, that, that idea of the individual, this romantic thing becomes something as powerful as, you know, uh, Star Wars, 1977. It was the top person movie in 1977. And then of course by 1980, it's only natural that you're gonna Gonna elect a guy in a cowboy hat. Right? <laughs> so, so I think that, that those stories really, really matter, and people want to believe they're part of those stories. Now, the Trump story was, was different than that, but one of the things that I'm always saying to people is that it doesn't help to push back on that story and say that's wrong. I mean, it's interesting that it's wrong. The cowboys were always dependent on the federal government, a third of the women of color. You know, you, you go, but, but, like, you don't go up to that somebody wandering around talking about Ra Ra and the cowboy and say, hey, did you know? Actually. Um, but what you do is you have better stories. And what you read at the beginning of, of this talk, I think is a better story. It's not an individual who's out there lording it over other people and, and, and crushing individuals and living all by himself. It's a story of communities and ordinary people and families working together to make things better for everybody. And that's a much better story than I'm out here in the high chaparral with my gun, I think. <laughs> Who 
kudos to the writer of that story. 